We are so honored to officially welcome back because um, we did host um, Rachel for her memoir, but this is her celebration of her very first novel, The Ballerinas. Um, it is the number one library reads pick for December, and it is congratulations to you on that. And um, it was also um, called out in the New York Times as one of um, notable books of December. Um, uh, it has been getting wonderful reviews, including this from Andrea Bartz, deftly constructed, crackling with tension, a stunner of a novel with electric prose. I tore through this unforgettable thriller. So uh, Rachel Kapelke Dale is also the co-author of Graduates in Wonderland, a memoir about uh, the significance and nuance of female friendships. She is the author of the Vanity Fair column, Advice from the Stars. She spent years in intensive ballet training. <laughs> when you were 15, right? Yeah, <laughs> they didn't put that in the bio. Um, she grew up, and they also didn't put in the bio. They said you live in Paris. They didn't say you grew up in Milwaukee. I just want to note that if you had grown up in New York, they would have said it. <laughs> So with that said, um, we are particularly honored to have um, Christina Clancy, the author of The Second Home in the Shoulder Season, and uh, Shoulder Season, there's no article there, um, in conversation, uh, one of our favorite conversation partners, and happens to be the same editor, right, of St. Martin. So if you like one, you will like the other. So that's the way booksellers do these things. So um, welcome back to the United States to Rachel Kabelke dale Let's give her a big hand. Thank you very much. Is this on? It is. Hey, <laughs> Rachel, I'm so excited to be in conversation with you. I've been thinking about your book so much and I have so many questions. And whenever I have a lot of questions about a book, it means it's gonna be great for book clubs. So if you're watching and you're in a book club, there's so much to unpack and digest in this novel. So I'm really excited to have you here in Milwaukee and to talk about your novel. And um, just so you know, so I wanna leave lots of time so that people can ask questions, both virtually. So if you're online, feel free to add some questions in the comments section. And if you're here, we'd love to hear from you. It's so nice to have a live audience at a book event. Don't you guys feel so excited to be here? Yeah. <laughs> And um, so I have been thinking about all the things we have in common. So one of them is we are both from Milwaukee. We both left Milwaukee to live in exotic places. You live in Paris, I live in Madison. Uh, <laughs> and we've written books that are about the institutionalization of female beauty. And I think there's so much that I'm interested in from that perspective, because I wrote about Playboy bunnies and you wouldn't think necessarily that they have a lot in common with ballerinas, but I kept thinking that they really do um, when I was reading. And we also have the same press, St. Martin's Press, which has been wonderful and the same amazing editor, Sarah Canton. So yeah, it's so fun to be able to talk. I mean, I could just talk shop all night, but I have so many other questions. So I wanna ask you about the book. I wanna ask you about your writing process. And I also wanna make sure that we get time for everyone to ask their questions. So in, I know this is kind of hard because you talk about your book all the time, but for people who have never read it, how do you, how do you distill what the book is about um, to, so that they'll, they'll get a sense of not only what it is, but why they'll want to read it? I'm not sure that I have the, oh, is this on? I think you press this, oh, great. This button, oh, thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure I have the elevator pitch totally <laughs> down. Uh, I would all, <laughs> what I often say is it's Paris Ballerina's murder. So I'm just kind of toss in the <laughs> word salad out the there. The triumvirate, that works. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, it's about, uh, you know, coming home. It's a, it's a homecoming story and um, about, you know, reuniting with people that you knew when you were young and trying to come to terms with, you know, how everybody's changed. Well, you know, the past is such a, um, a, a presence, you know, in, in one's life. So, yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's absolutely riveting. I couldn't put it down. I, I was on, I started it on an airplane thinking I'd just read for about 20 minutes. And before I knew it, the plane landed and it was just about done. And then my daughter was reading it. She's 25 and she was absolutely 
engrossed in the story and was really excited that I was here to talk to you about it. So it's nice to know that a book has broad appeal for a lot of different ages too. You know, that there's a lot that I could relate to in the book and also a lot that my daughter saw in it. Are you experiencing that? Oh, that's so nice to hear. I mean, that's the best compliment, you know, an author can get is, you know, the, the excitement of reading. Um, yeah. And actually, you know, one thing that Sarah Canton, our editor, and I were talking about, you know, when, when I was uh, revising is that there really are major characters at every age. You know, there's the three main characters and the narrator who in the present day timeline are uh, in their mid 30s. And uh, in the past timeline, I think it starts when they're, uh, I guess, about 12 and uh, goes from there into their early 20s. But there's also the artistic director in her 50s. There's a you know close neighbor who's uh, in her 70s. And that was really important to me because the, the book uh, at, at the Paris Opera Ballet, which is where these dancers work, there's a mandatory retirement age of 42. And uh, as I was writing this, I was thinking, you know, a lot about the way that, you know, these institutions, the institutions that, you know, purportedly celebrate femininity in some ways also reinforce these, uh, you know, it really um, kind of draconian standards at the same time. And, uh, you know, I think there is kind of this, uh, the sense that Delphine, the narrator, has of, you know, even though she's no longer a dancer, but, you know, thinking, oh, God, it's all over, you know, by the time I hit 40, you know, no matter what, when really her artistic career is just beginning. So it was important to me to go, you know what, life's a lot longer than that. <laughs> Life is not just your teens and 20s, even if you are a woman. <laughs> Thank goodness for books, right? <laughs> to help us see that. But I think whether you're a dancer or not, there is a sense when you're in your 30s of, of a certain kind of your like sexual youth and exuberance starting to, to wane or maybe coming to a close. When you were saying there's a mandatory um, the retirement age, it reminded me of Logan's Run. Do you guys remember <laughs> that old TV show um, where people know it? No? Logan's Run? Oh, don't watch it. I had so many nightmares when I was growing up. I think the age was 29. And as soon as someone was 29, they just got decommissioned. They would just go. And then it was about some people trying to escape it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's really interesting that you're writing about women in, in, of that age and, and thinking about how both their, I mean, there's, there's so much about how we see ourselves, how we're seen by others, how institutions see us and how they define um, their insecurities. Like the, the women in each one of them, there's three friends. Um, and maybe you can talk about the three different friends and kind of where they are in their lives and how they come together. Cause this book is very much about friendship and coming back, like you were saying, returning to friends. Yeah, absolutely. So Delphine, again, is the first person narrator. And uh, she left the Paris Opera Ballet when she was 22 and a soloist there, which is the second highest rank. So she had already made quite a lot of progress in her career, um, but uh, decided to give it up to become a choreographer and uh, leaves Paris to uh, move to St. Petersburg with her boyfriend. And at 36, when the, the present day timeline starts, she's coming back uh, after their breakup to choreograph a piece for the Paris Opera Ballet, uh, where her friends that she trained with still are dancing. So she's now in this position of power over them uh, that she never really uh, had before. And she's trying to learn how to use that. But of course, she's still, she's not the top of the institution. She has more power, but she doesn't have much power. Um, meanwhile, there's Lindsay, uh, her friend who's an American dancer. Uh, her parents were, um, uh, sorry, what's the word? Ambas you know, were, were diplomats. And um, she, um, so she trained from a young age with the Paris Opera Ballet School. And she's 36 as well, but she's still a soloist. And so she really wants to make it up to this highest level of star. Um, at, so I misspoke earlier at Paris Opera Ballet, there's a even higher level than other companies have. So it'd be soloist principal star. And so she wants to do this before the mandatory retirement age at 42. Um, and the question I think that is, hovers throughout the first part of the book is, you know, is this even possible? You know, it's the uh, it's, dancers tend to peak early, especially in ballet. Uh, and then there's Margot, who is uh, the same age, you know, is also trained with them 
uh, is French, but she's grown increasingly disillusioned uh, with the, you know, the life that she leads as a dancer and feels that her world is very closed off. And yet she has no training in anything else. You know, she's had some success as a dancer. Um, and so she's kind of, uh, you know, taken this frustration and turned it in on herself. So they're all struggling in their own ways at the beginning of the book. And that interacts in each one's pain kind of interacts with the others and with the past narrative, I think. Yeah, it's wonderful how um, you write, how, how, how clearly you write about that feeling of claustrophobia inside this institution that they really don't know very much else, you know, that's happening there. And I was, I was actually talking to my daughter about this and I said, do you think they're naive or, or not, you know, because in some ways, when I was young, I would think that these women were not naive because they had all this exposure to other people their own age and um, some of those things. But I think they were in a way like very naive and impeded by the limits of what they could experience and know by being part of this, this very um, competitive opera company. I mean, in fact, the or Paris Opera Company, like in fact, the competition, I think, is something that you write really well about. Like you wonder which one of the women is going to get ahead. And and I think even just writing about female ambition is so interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because when I started thinking about this novel, I wanted to write it from Lindsay's perspective. I think as the American character, I was most drawn to her. Um, but it really very quickly became clear to me that that doesn't work because she's still within the system and she also still buys into the system. And it creates this narrative that's just way too claustrophobic, too claustrophobic because you're going, you know, you're inside this mindset and you're trying, you know, it's hard to get readers to care about these goals that are so particular to this world, you know, and, and to invest the same amount of passion that the characters are when you're kind of entering through this very narrow, you know, this very narrow perspective. And so I thought, you know, no, I really need, you know, I really need to tell this from Delphine's perspective because she's the only one. I mean, I think even at the beginning, she still doesn't really see it, but she's the only one who has even enough perspective to kind of recognize things for what they are. But it's funny at the beginning, I was talking, I talked a lot about the, the point of view with my with my father, who's also a, a writer, and uh, you know, saying it's almost like a it's almost like a sports memoir, you know, and uh, not a sports memoir, a sports story, you know, and that you're trying to get the readers to enter in this particular world with stakes that may not seem important to anybody who doesn't care about that world inherently, you know, and uh, for that I needed an ambassador. <laughs> So. I, I was thinking that it felt like a sports story too, because there's hard work. Yeah. You know, the 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 hours that these women train yeah. is just grueling, and you write about it so vividly. And my favorite scene actually in the book is when I, I, I'm not giving anything away, but you write about the female ballerinas and the and the male ballerinas when they get together for the first time at 16, yeah. and how the the young women have never had that kind of prolonged contact with men. And then suddenly they're expected to have their hands all over their bodies and trust them while they throw them in the air. And it was, I thought that was just riveting. There is that was, thank you. That's one of the last scenes that I wrote uh, oh. actually. So I think I had to really have written the rest of the novel to understand, you know, what that meant, you know, at that age. Um, but yeah, partnering, it's, it's actually a level I never reached in dance. And I was just thinking, you know, of myself at 15 and if I'd kept going for another year and, you know, I was really scared of partnering already. You know, it's a terrifying prospect to give up that control. Um, there's a wonderful writer who came out with a memoir last year. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right. It's Ellen O'Connell Whitted, I think is her last name. She wrote this book, a memoir called uh, What You Become in Flight about uh, an injury that uh, she sustained while partnering that ended her dance career. And she's a, she's a wonderful writer. She's now a professor, I think, at Irvine. Um, but it's uh, it really, I think, helped bring home to me that sense of just, you know, how much power you're giving up in that uh, moment. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about the stakes and people mm -hmm. understanding the stakes. In that scene, you understand the stakes. Yeah, you know, these you. young, insecure women 
all of a sudden being in that situation. And also you write a lot about like the blisters in the feet and mm. there, there's a lot of um, like you, you might want to make a, an appointment with your podiatrist. <laughs> you know, right? It's like, cause you'll feel like your feet have gone through what the ballet dancers have gone through. It's really, it's, it's so knowledgeable. I would never have guessed that you weren't already, a, that you hadn't been a star ballerina because it's, <laughs> it was the, the I, I learned so much about a world I really didn't know very much about. You know, I think I, I experienced that world the way most women do, like maybe your daughters were enrolled in ballet, or maybe you took a few ballet classes. Maybe you had the music box with the twirling ballerina, <laughs> but um, that was kind of the limits of it. And you wrote a wonderful essay that was in Lit Hub. And um, my favorite thing that you said in that essay was that women are expected to be, or ballerinas are just expected to be one thing and that's it. Mm. Like we expect them to be beautiful and poised and, and uh, like to achieve this kind of grace, but yet there's no more. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, it's, if you've ever seen a chorus line, <laughs> there is, a, there is a, you know, it's a kind of star who comes back and needs a job and she's auditioning for the chorus line and the problem, I mean, there are lots of problems without recapping the whole movie. One of the issues is that she can't dance like everybody else. She's so used to the special flourishes and the this and the that. And you know, when you train as a dancer, and I, I think I, I write about this in the book, especially at Paris Opera Ballet or any kind of school that's attached to an institution, most of those students, you know, it's already very competitive to get in, but most of those students will not make it into the company. Those who do make it in the company will be apprentices, maybe, you know, then maybe join the core, which is like the entry level chorus line position. And when they do that, they all pretty much have to dance the same. You know, they're there to be uniform. You know, I think it ends up being something like one in a million who will make it to this kind of star level. And even then, you know, when, when you think about in kind of popular imagination, the dancers who are famous from, say, the 20th century, you know, today you have Misty Copeland. A lot of people know her, you know, from her Instagram and, you know, her books and, uh, and all of that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how, how many people have actually seen her dance. She's wonderful. But, you know, if you think about 20th century dancers who are famous, you know, I think very few people would be able to name even, you know, the most famous stars. I think the names that come to mind are still the men. They're Barishnikov, they're Nureyev, and they're the men who had political stories, you know, behind them with defecting and, you know, the Soviet uh, angle and all of that. So there really is a kind of uniformity that's uh, prized in ballet and, uh, you know, until the very top when all of a sudden you want to show you know, the, uh, the things that make you special and that make you unique, but almost nobody will ever get there. Um, so it's a really strange, it's a really strange balance. And uh, this is a bit of a sidebar, but one of the issues with that for a long time is that, you know, people of color were not in the ballet world really at all. You know, they're going, well, we need the core to look the same, you know, and then, the, you know, when dancers started, you know, pushing through and breaking, breaking barriers they're going, oh, well, Actually, this is fun. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is not the problem we thought it would be. So it's a yeah, it's a, it's a world with its own rules, certainly. Yeah, it's interesting. You you want to be the same, but you mm -hmm. also are think that like when I bet the ballerinas expect that they are going to be the same, but that they're still going to be recognized as special and different. Yeah, in that situation. I remember you know taking classes when I was. Uh, 13 or 14 and uh you know we would do these little these little wrist flourishes which are not like a an accept you know there, there's something that you would maybe see you know the, the famous dancer add a little flourish here or something like that and i remember a teacher who was it, he seemed ancient at the time and he was like 20 years old and he had just come back from and literally he was in high school with my sister <laughs> he had just come back from new york you know and he said you guys are you know you're 12 it looks ridiculous when you do you know just do it correctly at this point you know and someday years from now you can decide on the flourishes and uh i think that's probably right oh, that's, that's awesome well, I was wondering, do you mind reading a little bit from yeah, the ballerinas? I thought it would be nice to hear it in your voice. And 
I know readings are, we were talking earlier about how um, we used to back in the day, you'd go to an author reading and they'd read for almost the whole hour. Um, and now we're more in discussion, which I love, but I also do just love hearing some of the text in the author's voice. So yeah. I, um, you can pick where you want to start. Well, I'll read the prologue since um, talking to you guys earlier, some people have finished the book, some haven't started it yet. So this will uh, avoid any spoilers. And it's only like a page and a half. <laughs> mm -hmm. You start out as potential energy and then you fall. Before Natalie emailed and offered to take me back, before I killed anyone, I saw variations of the same quotation everywhere. Paris is always a good idea. On mugs, on throw pillars, pillows, on Instagram. Always attributed to Audrey Hepburn, always in pink. I couldn't escape it. Everywhere I went, there were those fucking words. At the time, they seemed like a sign that I should do it. I should go home. When I lived in Paris, I'd never had starry-eyed notions about what the city was, but I was perfectly ready to buy into them if they meant I could come back. Paris is always a good idea. Great. Bring on the macaron, the endless wine, the strolls along the Seine. But the truth is, I didn't know what Paris was like for most people. When you're the best at something, your world is small, your life is small. And for a few years, I was one of the best dancers on the planet. I was a member of the Paris Opera Ballet. I'd never thought about the city as extending beyond my tiny sphere of influence, which meant that Paris was small for me too. Paris was my birthplace, my home for the first 23 years of my life. It was where I had my first kiss, where I met my two best friends, where I danced in 64 performances of Swan Lake, 43 Nutcrackers, 26 Lasso Feeds, where my mother wrenched my three-year-old hand and ground it smarting against the wood of the bar. It's like church, okay? You know how you have to stay quiet and still during church? Just pretend like you're there. She took hold of my thigh, twisting it so that my knee faced out 90 degrees to the side. Then she took the other and did the same so that my heels were touching. There, that's first position. It's like church? I mean, you're not in charge of anything, all right? The only thing you're in charge of is your own body. You start out as whole and then you break. Now, of course, it's a totally different story. I still see that quote all over the place and it sends needles of rage shooting through my bloodstream. If I'm in a good mood, it irritates me. If I'm in a bad one, it makes me wanna grab Audrey Hepburn by her bony shoulders and shake her until her teeth rattle. Always a good idea. Paris is nothing more than an empty stage. It's only as good or bad as the people in it. And the willful naivete of that statement turns my stomach. I don't see what good it does to mythologize a city. Sure, it's pretty, but how much is pretty worth? Paris is also a place where the government massacred its citizens, lining them up against the wall of the cemetery, throwing their bodies into a huge communal trench. Paris is a place where, under siege one freezing winter, the citizens ate every animal in the zoo. Paris is a place that transported more than 10,000 children to death camps. Audrey did get one thing right, though. Paris is, more than anything else, an idea. Maybe in the end, the romantics dreaming about Paris see the same thing in the city that I do, that empty stage a place where the rough edges can, are sloughed off behind the scenes, where the pain disappears behind pale pink spiles and satin, where the stage lights erase all shadows as they illuminate you with an otherworldly glow. But you start out as perfect and you become something else. That's a killer prologue. <laughs> I know there's in, in publishing, like I, I'll hear people grumble sometimes about prologues, but I will die on the prologue hill. I believe in prologues when they, when they're needed, you know, I love a prologue. And if I remember correctly, second home also has a really great one. Yeah. Both my books do. <laughs> That's why I have to defend them. Oh yeah. Then so do mine. Yeah. And apparently our editor doesn't mind prologues. So yeah, I've never heard a word of protest. Yeah. From her. Yeah. Well, you know, I think one thing that a prologue does is it sets up your, your narrator as safe. Uh -huh. So we know that your narr narrator is going to make it through in, in order to be able to tell this story. And, um, and we know, so you plant all these wonderful seeds, like before I killed someone, <laughs> you know, you just kind of toss that off. And another thing I was thinking you do so well is you describe place, you know, Paris really this, I mean, this is a book about ballerinas, but it's also a book about Paris. Do you think that the fact that you grew up in Milwaukee allows you 
to see Paris through like clearer eyes, maybe? I don't know if they're clearer, but uh, it's definitely, and again, that was one of the things with Delph that made Delphine such a good choice of, not good, but, but right for me, a uh, choice of narrator, which is that she's been away for a long time. So, uh, you know, the past scenes, the, the past timeline doesn't, doesn't have a lot of Paris in it because she just accepts it as normal. It's the present day timeline when she's coming back that uh, she's actually thinking about the city and and seeing it. Um, I, yeah, you know, the, the funny thing is I wrote um, a lot of the Paris stuff during, so I live in Paris and uh, there during the first part of COVID, the first wave of COVID, we were locked down in our apartments. You could only leave the um, apartment for uh, an hour a day, you know, for exercise and you had to have a pass, you know, with you and all of this. Um, you could only go within a kilometer of your house. So, you know, I was doing a lot of remembering when I was writing the Paris scenes and a lot of uh, kind of, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, imagining, you know, remembering really. Oh, it's amazing to think you were nostalgic for the place you were <laughs> while you were writing that. I mean, I think that comes through that sense of nostalgia. Oh, thank right. you. But I will say my next book does take place in Milwaukee because after that, uh, during the second and third lockdowns, I got very nostalgic <laughs> for uh, my hometown. So uh, I'll be interested to see what you all think of that one. <laughs> I love reading about Milwaukee in books. Oh, me too. So I'm I'm, all, I'm 100% behind that idea. Can you talk a little bit about your family being in Milwaukee? Because this is such a special thing to be at Boswell Books, right? And, you know, so close to where you grew up. Um, and it, you're, it sounds like everyone in your family is an artist and um, it's how, how lucky you are to have that situation. I bet I, if you could just say something. I, like I am very, very lucky. That is, uh, that, is no, uh, that is no exaggeration. Yeah, we grew, I grew up just around the corner um, and uh, this, we come here all the time when uh, we were kids. I was emailing Daniel, the, uh, the owner, uh, when we were setting up this uh, this event, they were saying, you know, I used to come when this this place used to be called Schwartz's, um, the the predecessor of uh, Boswell's. I said I used to come look in the fiction section, and I would find the place where my books would go alphabetically <laughs> one day. So it's very exciting to me to be able to uh, come back and uh, know that they'll actually be on those very shelves. Um, yeah, and uh, and I'm very very lucky in my in my family. Um, so let's see, we'll go uh, <laughs> chronologically in reverse. My mother, Kathleen Dale, is a poet um, for many years, an English professor as well. Um, she was just not. We got the news today that she was just nominated for a Pushcart. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about that. Um, it's it's not her first nomination either. Um, so uh, yeah, she's very talented. Um, my father, Steve Capelki, is, you know, is a, a wonderful writer, um, also trained as um, uh, in filmmaking. So he has this uh, wonderful storytelling instinct and uh, uh, worked for a long time at um, the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design and then Columbia College Chicago as a professor and in um, uh, as an administrator. My oldest sister, Jessica Capelki Dale, has a long and storied uh, background in theater, but she is a professor of um, public health at the nursing school at UWM. She has published some wonderful articles that are very far beyond uh, my intelligence level <laughs> um, to do with uh, her research, which is really exciting um, into, uh, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, into climate health and justice, climate justice. And uh, my younger sister, Liana Gavelki Dale, is a trained lawyer, but also a poet, uh, who just came out with uh, her first full-length uh, book of poetry called Sink Seeking the Pink, uh, which I would highly recommend. There's a lot of overlap thematically with ballerinas, um, and it's really wonderful. Um, and it has a beautiful cover as well. well that's great. <laughs> did, you, did people in your family read your book in draft stage or were you protective of it? Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, everybody reads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it's actually great. My father is often um, my first reader. Um, he, he is a really wonderful reader. Um, and 
it was really useful for it's incredibly useful always, but especially for this book, because you know, other than my own involvement in ballet, I think he could really take or leave this world. So, you know, there are people, there, there are always going to be readers coming to this book who have some background in ballet or some interest in the subject. And he wasn't one of those. So, you know, so I was crafting the beginning with the idea of I'm going to capture his, you know, his interest somehow. <laughs> and he, he must have read so many iterations of this um, and just it was really, really um, wise about stories. But I, everybody in the family has a, uh, read uh, early versions of this at, uh, at various points um, and uh, given different kinds of feedback, which are wonderfully helpful. I should also say I have a wonderful writing group in Paris that has, um, at even earlier stages, uh, is very, very helpful in workshopping, um, you know, bits and pieces here and there. So uh, yeah, I've been very lucky to be surrounded by um, artists and writers and thinkers and uh, yeah, of all kinds. I bet there are a lot of writers watching tonight thinking, <laughs> I would love to be a Kapelke Dale. <laughs> <laughs> and now since you both have the same editor, uh, can you say anything about your editorial process? Because I remember when I sold The Second Home, that was my first book, um, Sarah Canton, our editor, had such great advice. She said, I could see you trying to figure out how the book was going to resolve. But in the process, you kind of forgot to add some surprises in the last third of the book. And so I, I went back and that was the first big overall editorial advice that she got. And it was so helpful. And, and readers will always say they appreciate not knowing where that's going. What did, how did that go for you? Did you have any major revisions that you made? Because there's, there's a lot going on in the story. There's a lot of storylines. There's a lot of time shifting. There's a lot of characters. <laughs> well, I'll say the grass is the grass is always greener because I'm like, that sounds great <laughs> compared to what I got, which was. <laughs> oh, it was a wonderful process, and Sarah's amazing. Yeah. But the the major first revision was you need a second timeline because the whole the the draft that we sold was just the present timeline. She said, you know, there 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 needs to be a second timeline, and she was absolutely right. You know, we did, took a five minute conversation before I saw that you know these flashbacks that I'd worked into this present day narrative, you know, were really their own storyline with their own narrative arc and their own, you know, tensions and reveals, um, you know, which, which she saw and imagine, you know, she has such a wonderful, um, such a wonderful narrative mind. Uh, and, and she saw that right away, but, uh, you know, she, she didn't sugarcoat it, you know, she, it's going to be work. <laughs> oh yeah. You don't want your editor to sugarcoat you for do you not. because then you don't trust it. You're like, no, just bring it. I can, I can handle it. <laughs> I think for me, I'm much more likely to just go, oh, great. It's good. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know sometimes people want to rush to get a book out without, you know, thinking, well, I'll submit it and then I'll have an editor fix everything for me. Right. And that's really not how it goes. Like you still, like, even though you're still going to do a lot of work after you mm -hmm. sell it, it's, you want it to be as polished as possible. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, if I'd realized, you know, on my own that, uh, or, you know, or with my agent that. I wanted that second timeline in there, you know, it would have, you know, it would have been another year before, you know, it, it, we submitted it when I thought it was as polished and perfect as it could be. And I think that's what the role of a, a good editor is, is to open that up and help you get perspective back, you know, and think about the story mm -hmm. in new ways, which is really exciting. Yeah. And also we're lucky because yeah. I hear more and more that editors aren't giving a lot of feedback. So yeah. we're really lucky. And oh, incredibly so. It's funny because people always ask me what to read and some Sometimes I think it would be interesting to follow different editors. I bet like as booksellers, <laughs> you guys know that editors have a certain taste. Like Sarah discovered Taylor Jenkins Reid. Yes. And, you know, she was Jen Wiener. And so she, she just knows all these great writers that if you like, like our books are, are yeah. kind of of a piece too. You know, I can see yeah. how they would be in the same move. So exactly. I've been, uh, I had a brief chat with Rachel Hawkins on Twitter the other day. She's the author of The Wife Upstairs, this wonderful feminist Jane Eyre retelling uh, that came out uh, earlier this year, I think. And, um, you know, she was asking, I think, about the the next book. And I said, well, the next book is Piano Murder. <laughs> she, she, said, she said, well, my next book is Boat Murder. <laughs> and Sarah hopped in and she said, well, I do have a type. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so great. And, you know, speaking of that, I just have one other question. And actually, I have two more questions. And then I oh, want to yeah. hand it over to the audience. So my second to last question is, um, I've... The, 
would you call this a thriller or literary fiction? Because I, I think it kind of bridges both both genres. So I, I wonder how you would define it. And maybe it doesn't even need to be defined. Maybe it's <laughs> great that you're kind of merging both areas, but it's it's so literary and it's also it ha has elements of thriller. I love that you asked this question because this is it's something that I've been thinking about so much because um, because readers are really divided, you know, even a week after publication, some are going, you know, what a great thriller. And some are going, this isn't a thriller. <laughs> you know? so you're going, well, what is a thriller? I actually wrote a piece for Crime Reads that came out um, a couple of days ago saying, you know, I think when it comes to stories about female rage, I think redefining what a thriller is can be a little bit, it can be kind of useful um, because there's, you know, when women are mad, in fiction, so often, I mean, from Shakespeare on down, women are in fiction to maintain the social order. And so when they start to go against it, you start going, oh God, what's gonna happen? <laughs> you know? So I think it creates an underlying tension that's, you know, it's not um, a Soviet era spy thriller uh, type tension. It's a different kind of tension that, um, yeah, that, that may or may not be thriller-ish, but uh, I didn't think about it as a thriller when I was writing. I didn't um, knowingly try to use thriller, you know, genre tropes or anything like that. Um, I, <laughs> to tell the truth, I set out trying, trying to write um, like an updated version of the Judy Bloom book, Summer Sisters. Have you read this? <laughs> Which is like this lovely, you know, send, it's kind of sentimental, emotional um, book about this lovely friendship between these two women over the course of their lives. Um, and it's very sweet, which is not, you know, and then, and then I start writing my Valerina's book and like, you know, they're, they're yeah, it's, it's like it got a lot darker. <laughs> it sure did. Yeah. I was going, well, this is my, you know, I'm not Judy Blue. <laughs> right. Well, and I think too, what's difficult, and we're going to have to have a whole other follow on our conversation about this, but is this, this uh, chatter I hear about likable female characters. Uh, and one thing that I think bears repeating is that, or, or saying is that when you're critiquing an institution that is forcing women into a position of sameness and competing yeah. against each other, you're, you're showing how the institution corrodes their likability. Yeah. They become unlikable to other people. They become unlikable to themselves. And so yes. the goal of a writer is not to show them being really likable despite all the pressure they're under in these pressure cooker situations, but to show how they crack and, and, then, and then survive and come back. Yeah, I appreciate that so much because I really, really agree with that, um, with that statement. For me, the, the likability of, any character is so second it's it's so irrelevant i mean to me it's it's are they interesting mm -hmm. you know i more than one people, person including in my writing group has pointed out you know there are no likable male characters in this novel and i said well yeah it's a first person narrative she doesn't think any of them are likable mm -hmm. so she's presenting them in this way you know and actually there are a few likable male characters in the novel but they're all ballet characters Don Quixote, uh, the Nutcracker Prince. <laughs> They're all fictional, which of course mine are too. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and men are not under the same pressure to have likable characters in their books too. So I think yeah. I, oh, there's just so much we can say about that. I mean, Fight Club, Catcher in the Rye. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yes. I mean, are they interesting? That's but are the... they likable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, that's the same level as that. You know, with the politician, do you want to have a beer with him? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so my my second to last question, or my last question, and then I want to um, open it up for some audience questions, is, you know, the holidays are coming and we're in a bookstore, are there any books that you think would be great gifts? Oh, shoulder season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're $5. $5. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was describing it to my family um, the, earlier this afternoon, and they're going, I didn't know there was a Playboy Resort in, you know, Lake Geneva, or, you know, and the, you know this, yeah, it's a really, really interesting, uh, really interesting book. Um, let's see. Oh, there, I mean, there's so many great ones that are out right now. Um, I just started the new Leon Moriarty, which uh, she's always one of my favorites. I think it's Apples Never Fall. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely recommend um, What You Become in Flight, which is a lovely um, and painful memoir. Um, 
that I think takes uh, kind of the dancing memoir just to uh, just breaks all of the kind of genre expectations of that. Um, that one's really lovely. Um, yeah, there's a the, um, actually a member of my writing book, a writing group, excuse me, sorry, I'm still in Paris time, um, called Amanda Dennis, uh, wrote a wonderful book called Her Here this year, um, just came out in March, and it's like a literary mystery where uh, with a lot of intertextuality and uh, um, a lot of Paris scenes, but also uh, farther flung locations. And the writing there is just exquisite. So I'd absolutely recommend that too. All right. Yeah. Isn't it hard when you ask that question? Because you know, like you, we're always <laughs> reading, and, but then sometimes we can be. Well, and it's, it, it's exciting because, you know, in launch week, you know, you, you, you talk to a lot of people and a lot of people ask, and I don't like to recommend the same things, you know, over and over because there's so many great books out there that you just want to go, you know, no, I need to think of, you know, wait, wait, who were the other ones that I was reading? And, <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, let's see what other people are asking about. And I think we should do the virtual, like welcome some virtual questions yeah, first. Um, Chrissy, is the virtual and audience questions, you can repeat the questions. Oh, great. So, sure. Um, but yeah, the first question, Joy asks, how long did you study ballet and did you enjoy it while you were studying? Yeah, so how long did you study ballet and did you enjoy it when you were studying it? So I studied ballet in total. I don't, I'm not sure I ever read it up when I was really little and then I came back in when I was 10 or 11 and danced intensively till I was 15. Um, actually, one of my former dance teachers is here tonight in the audience, which is very, very exciting for me. Um, I absolutely enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved it. Um, there was at 15, I had, a, I had a hip injury. And at that point, I was attending a high school for the, well, the high school for the performing arts here in Milwaukee, um, where we had dance, uh, two dance classes a day. And I had dance every day after school. And on Saturdays, I think we had six or seven hours um, with rehearsals and things. And um, so I, I got injured. And it's kind of the moment where you step back and you go, you know, is this actually the career for me? And I just, I wasn't built for it. You know, on a, if I had a different body, I probably would have continued on, but, you know, having the body that I have and, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, when, when I had three months away and I had to actually, you know, be honest with myself and go, it only gets more intense from here on out. Um, you know, that's, uh, it was time to make some decisions. So I loved it at the time. And um, I'm also very happy that I've explored other things since then. So, you know what they say, everything is material. Everything so. is material. It's very annoying when you're going through a breakup though and a writer friend's like, oh, everything's material. Yeah, no, <laughs> don't say that to a writer. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Bad things don't happen to you if you can't handle them. <laughs> Should we do one more question from the online? Okay, great. What, does anyone have questions in the audience? It's so nice to look at a, a real live audience. Yeah. How did you do the research about the Paris Ballet? Okay, so the question is, how did you do research about the Paris Opera Ballet? So a lot of the information that I needed was um, very basic. For me, the most important thing, it's important that you know, that, that the depiction of the institution be accurate. But the most important thing was that the story had you know, emotional truth. And so I wrote the story first and uh, I was saying this to my little sister the other day, but apparently the writers on Grey's Anatomy, you know, they don't actually um, have any medical knowledge. They hire outside consultants for that. And so inside the scripts, when they turn them in, it just says, you know, medical, medical <laughs> in capital letters. And so I would leave these same kind of placeholders, you know, for myself about, you know, things that I needed to research. Where is this particular thing in the building? You know, what's, you know, what's an interesting studio space here and there? Um, at the beginning, it was a lot of uh, documentaries, just trying to get the feeling of the, in, the inside of the institution, um, which is, you know, famously, um, you know, a little difficult to penetrate. And then, um, but of course the past timeline, I didn't write until lockdown. So um, there, but this is a really celebrated um, national institution in France. And so there were, there were a million resources from 
kind of the 50s onwards that you can find on you know YouTube there are memoirs there are you know these things so it was really a lot of remote research even though I was in Paris um, because a lot of those details came later and uh, yeah and the the pandemic uh, yeah forced that a little bit it's a great question great. anyone else so i'll just repeat the question yeah do you keep a writer's notebook when you're going about your daily life i wish i was that kind of person i'm not nearly that organized I tend to keep about six or seven notebooks at a time, as well as my notes app, um, read the backs of receipts, things that just whatever's around. Um, I, I tend to have these really long kind of wool gathering periods, brainstorming periods before I ever sit down and start to write um, of months or, you know, or even, you know, years where you know, I'm just gathering the material and things will come to me or lines or look into this or you know, things like that. Um, and then before I can write, I actually put it all into an Excel sheet so I can start moving things a little bit. For me, if it's in a notebook and it's all in order, it's like that order takes precedence you know, and I'm not able to play with it and be as flexible with different observations. And I also have a hard time letting go of things. And if I can just keep a tab in Excel, like I'll come back to this, you know, and then forget about it. Uh, it makes it easier to just let it uh, <laughs> sit on its own. Aren't some of your notebooks, like when you look at a detail, you're like, where did this come from? <laughs> like you look at it years later. My, I mean, my, mine have grocery lists in them. They have, you know, I'm balancing my checkbook and them. I mean, they're, I, you hear about writers giving their um, estates to universities and I'm going, who would ever want this? Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's great. Any other, yeah. Great. Were you always in a writer's workshop or is that something that you started in Paris? So I've, I did some workshops in college um, back in the day. Um, but other than that, I was write, really writing on my own until I moved back to Paris three and a half years ago. So, um, but, it, but, but, you know, it, I think growing up in a family of writers, you know, and, and, you know, and academics, it's, you really just learn really quickly on that you can't uh, be precious about things. So I kind of, you know, and that everything's flexible, everything can change. So I think for me, like the, the workshop was easy to embrace, even after all that time writing on my own, because I, you know, I had the sense of, you know, it's, it's here to make my work better. It's, you know, it's people giving their time. It's, this and that and if you know if it starts to really be painful I just pretend like it's somebody else's story and I go yeah that is that does need work yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great one more question okay so now that you've written one book what will you do differently next time and what was the second part what, what's the biggest lesson for writing Oh, the biggest lesson from writing this book. That's tough. So um, I already did the next time. I have uh, my second book coming out next December. Um, and I think, I think it's Vonnegut who said, you never learn how to write a novel. You only learn how to write the novel you're writing. <laughs> and, uh, that's kind of after the the edition of the second timeline, I said, I'm never going to write another, I'm never going to write a dual timeline story again. And I was writing the second one. I was going, you know what? It needs it though. <laughs> this one is also two stories that merge, you know, when inter you know, needs it. Um, so, you know, never say never. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I 
I think, I mean, I think each book is kind of a, in some ways a reaction. Every, it's all about what you learned from the last one, you know, and in the upcoming book, which is called The Ingenue, you know, I wanted to um, take a step back and, you know, work with, work with different kinds of storytelling, different, you know, narrative voices. So um, it's third person, not first person. And there are excerpts from, you know, the mother who writes these feminist fairy tales or excerpts from her books uh, throughout that book. So, you know, to, to play with voices and things like that. Um, I'm not sure that answers the question really well, but uh, again, like I think that the, the narrative lessons that you learn are so particular to each book. You know, there's no, there's no um, way of building a better mouse trap for <laughs> that uh, for that process. It's kind of terrifying, isn't it, to start over again? But the mm. thing that's helpful for me is to know I did it. Yeah, like I wrote a book before, <laughs> so I can do it again. That's all I need to know. I've said that exact same thing. Yeah. To myself. <laughs> That's great. Do we have one more question? Yeah. Oh, that's a great last question. So what advice would you give to aspiring writers? Okay, read the most that you possibly can, particularly within the genre that you're writing. Um, that's not just good writing advice, it's just kind of good career advice because when you're pitching an editor or an agent even, they're gonna be like, who do you, you know, who do you read in this, in this genre? And you don't wanna say, nobody else has ever written anything like this before because they're gonna hear this book won't sell. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's also just really, really helpful to build up like a really high level of linguistic fluency, you know, across, you know, and, and to know what choices you're making when you're making them um, and not just think that there's, uh, you know, not to get stuck in the way that's maybe most instinctual. So I think, I think read a lot and, you know, I think, I think the more that you can build a community of writers too um, and read what other writers at the same career point are doing, you know, and the ways in which they're processing feedback, the things that they're coming out with. I think it helps keep a real level of excitement, you know, and uh, in the process, and it keeps you from getting too, uh, from taking yourself too seriously, <laughs> you're getting too stuck in your own work. Um, so I found that really helpful too. Great. Well, Rachel, this is such a huge accomplishment. You're making Milwaukee proud. We love Boswell books so much. We love Thank Boswell you, books. Thank you, Chris. I love Thank to you see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much. We are honored to have both of you. And especially, it's particularly important for us to have people writing about Milwaukee, too. Yes. Because um, uh, we are going to have you sign at the front of the store. We have about 25 minutes for signing. And um, we are so thankful to both of you and um, thank you for everyone for coming out. We wouldn't have a bookstore without you. Hope you see, to see you at another event.